Again, thanks for being here. Uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers when we're done. We're going to talk about the middle school replacement project. Uh, difficult pattern to come up with in the beginning. We are actually looking to build a high school, as we'll talk about. But right now, we're in the 106 year old building that, uh, due to various circumstances, is going to be due to be replaced uh, due to projected potential costs. So, what is proposed? Replace this existing structure, the 106 year old middle school building, as well as the bus garage with a new state-of-the-art high school. New high school would be tied into and would maintain the use of the west end of the current high school. Uh, middle school students would be moved to the current high school and we replace the middle school gym with a larger multi-purpose gymnasium that could accommodate uh, physical education classes as well as extracurricular activities. Um, to get kind of a visual, this right here is our current high school. Uh, one of the things that some people have trouble kind of saying, what is this gonna look like? When, where does the middle school go? So, Right now, the middle school is over here. Right here is the front end to the high school. Um, so what you're seeing here is this breezeway that connects the two buildings. This would become the middle school existing. And this area over here is one of our shared spaces, such as our commons, our band room. We have art classes, we have SES, a lot of things that middle schoolers take. This would be more like a shared area. The new high school would go down here, and the existing or the middle school would move to the existing high school space. Um, how did we get here? In 2019, we started having some community goal setting meetings, and believe it or not, even before 2019, when we built the science and addiction in 2010, we talked about lack of gym space, using this gymnasium for middle school students, PE classes, where you might have 50 kids running around in here was very difficult, uh, but that started kind of some of the process. In 2020, we got some initial architect designs, we identified we needed facilities in 2021, and the, this spring, we did some school facility forums. Um, what have we done? If anyone wants a copy of this slideshow, you're welcome to it. I can have you email that to you. The purpose of this is not to read through and say everything we've done. The purpose of this is to demonstrate that uh, over this time, over the last five years, we've not been letting our buildings go. We've been working to upkeep them, work to maintain them. We've done various projects at various levels. Really a, a very nice job of keeping us up to date on the facilities to the extent we can. But as we're going to see, some of the middle school issues are just becoming uh, too difficult to overcome with simple maintenance. Uh, why are we doing this? One, we want to make sure our students have an excellent learning environment. And one of the things that pushed it forward a little bit as well was uh, recommended repairs to the middle school total just over $10 million. And we'll have building tours later, you can see some of the things. But the biggest driver of the cost are things like replacing you know, leaky water pipes or you know, condensation or HVAC units. A lot of the biggest costs driving this are the fact that we're in a 106 year old building and a lot of the uh, infrastructure of that building is struggling, as well as some exterior seats like you know, the lintels and support structures as we start to see some of those things deteriorate. And when we saw this number going to be 10 million, we thought, is it worth putting $10 million in the building that may last you know, 20, 30 more years, or we look to replace at a, a different cost? Another thing too, a lot of people are not aware, the most recent five year average of students serving our schools is up more than 75 students annually or 7%. Uh, we are unique in Illinois in general that we have continued to grow, especially in the last five years. We're very fortunate that we have uh, a supportive community and people want to be in Seoul. So our schools are actually seeing a significant increase in student enrollment. That also ties into what we are talking about is, do we replace this building in the bus garage with uh, a new high school building? Uh, we have a separate process about adding a wing to elementary school to support some of the additional kids. And with this process, fifth grade would actually go back to elementary school to more align with different K-5 curriculum and other ways to serve kids. One of the benefits, and there are numerous, I won't go through all of this necessarily, but uh, modern classes for high school, ability to update CTE classes, middle school, if you go on a tour later, uh, the class sizes are, we'll go with strange. Uh, right now, most classes are built in squares. Uh, a lot of these are long, they have nooks, some have like a space that was built in them because it used to be an office. Uh, but if I have, you know, better temperature control and fewer leaks for the big ones, having a leaky classroom, and we have a new roof or a newer roof, but the thing is that the pipes, condensation, different factors will have leaks that we are battling on a pretty consistent basis, and temperature control. It's hard to learn when you're really, really hot, it's hard to learn when you're really, really cold, and the infrastructure of this building does not allow us to get a very good temperature regulation. Um, the middle schools regain the current high school gym to have a place to play that is more uh, in line with other middle school facilities. It would allow them to have a place to play within their own building. Right now, people don't come to middle school very often. We kind of hide this away because it doesn't look particularly good uh, way to show up our community. So we don't use this, we're using this at least as
as we can. Uh, the high the middle school would have a new gym, or not a new gym, but a new to them gym that they could use for that purpose. And uh, a multi-purpose gymnasium, again, putting 50 kids in physical education in this room, there's not a lot of space to move. Uh, large student events, multiple tracks can help simultaneously. So district finances, uh, a lot of people see this building think it's 160 years old, yeah, maybe it's be replaced. I think it's really important to make sure that people understand where we are financially. Probably the biggest argument that people talk about, should we do this or should we not, are things like cost, taxes, uh, spending within your budget, being good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And I, I like to show this slide to make sure people understand kind of where we are. This is also on the sheet you have, on the back side of the sheet, there's additional information about this. But as far as district finances, in 2021, operational cost per pupil. And this encompasses Moultrie County and the surrounding counties. So if you're contiguous to Moultrie County, your data is included in here. Our district last year, and really consistently over time, ranked number 25 out of 25 in the amount of money that we spent per pupil on education. Uh, we are dead last, and we are generally dead last on a regular basis. Now, there are a lot of ways that we are efficient in our use of funds. If we had spent $2 million more million in the last four years, we would still be dead last. In order for us to get up to this average for the last four years, we've had to spend $11 million additional dollars. So we saved basically $11 million compared to the average on what we spend. When talking about things like budgeting and cutting costs, we do a very good job of that. We have a lot of built-in efficiencies within our district. Uh, the fact that we are on one campus, the fact that we are a size of around you know, 1,100 is an is a ideal size for a district. It allows you to share different resources. We share our middle school, high school, you know, some specialty teachers. So we have a lot of built-in advantages. But again, uh, we are dead last in consistently. We're very, very low on this factor. EBS percent, a lot of people don't understand this. General state aid used to be the way that schools are funded. They now determine how close are you to your advocacy? How much do your local resources chip into where you are? And once again, we are you know, very, very, very last. We have in Sullivan fewer resources than everyone else does. You wouldn't see us looking at our education. We're also very good about, if you look at the percent of our expenditure that go toward instruction, we're actually one of the highest schools. The money we spend goes to teaching kids. That's a really, really good feather in the cap that when we spend money, it's to teach kids. We don't have a lot of wasted spending and other things like that. I would also note that on this number, if we were to build a new building, facility costs don't go into that number, so either those schools are putting money in facilities, that does not affect their numbers, that won't affect ours in the future. But when it comes to EDF and funding of access to, Sullivan again ranks absolutely dead last of the 25 schools in the area, so they're consistently in that place. As far as, so we have the most control over this. We can say what money we're going to spend. We have a little control over this. This depends on how much EAV, how much value is within our county, how many you know, houses are built and businesses are built. Uh, that determines how much access we have to funds. As far as tax rate, this says projected. This was made before the tax bill came out. The tax bill came out to be 4.188. So it rounds to 4.19 to project the correct number. We're at 4.19. We're consistently kind of in the bottom half, bottom third area. With the referendum, we specifically have tied it into by using other revenue streams, we want to make sure we're not in the top half. We want to say, we want to pick an amount that we can get to that's going to keep us in the top half, and we're going to use other existing funds. Um, it is really, really important to understand that uh, when we talk about what's going to cost, a lot of this cost is going to be within current revenue streams. We're not asking, we're going to, we have to ask for that number, but to get to that number, we're actually going to take a lot of existing money to get there. Part of it is the cost is going to be, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, 27 million. To begin with, we're asking for 25. We're going to use 2 million in fund balances to cover some of that cost. But the other piece I want to say about this is um, on a $100,000 home, the tax rate uh, will affect it, and that'll go up about $5, $5 per month. Uh, for a rep rate, our tax rate is going to be 4.19 to 4.37, so 0 0.18. And if anyone has a tax bill or wants to bring in a tax bill, I can show you exactly what that will look like and how it will affect you. We are going up for a $25 million uh, bond issue, 0.18. For reference, there's an area school that's asking for $30 million for repairs, and they're going up 0.84. So $30 million, 0.84, we're going up $25 million, 0.18. Roughly 75% of these dollars come from existing revenue streams that are already there. When bonds expire, we can roll that payment into this. So when we say it's $5 a month or $100,000 home, home that is done by using existing dollars. We also have a very, very large TIF expiring, and tax credit financing is a very complicated issue. But since 1986, there's a large swath of Sullivan area that those taxes go directly to a TIF account but with a city, and they're redistributed. That comes off the books and goes back to the uh, taxing body, such as the school. So we will basically gain $15 million in EAV that we can use that money to go towards paying off this project. The biggest thing I 
think people should understand is, as we ask for $25 million, about 75% of that is actually not new taxes. It's maintained the, the place where we are due to unique factors such as a TIP expiring this year. Uh, as far as the facility tax, this concludes just to talk about right now we're the lowest on revenue funds, but the facility tax is separate on top of that. Uh, just for reference, most schools have it. Several schools have a chunk. I mean, even ARC is about 78%, I believe. Windsor's in the 70s, County Parents in the 50s. A lot of these schools have a large percentage of it. We have zero. Uh, we're the only of the contiguous counties that do not have the facility tax. That could be used to go for this. And some people brought up, you know, do we use that? Uh, it would be an option later to go back and use that to actually bring our tax rate back down to where it is or potentially lower. That's a conversation for the future. But that's a general idea of district finances. A lot of people, I think we have phenomenal schools. I think a lot of people agree with great schools. A lot of people don't realize we do it at such an efficient and economical manner. So what are the costs? I talked about this earlier. $27 million. There are several different floor plans, several different options. They all come in around these same numbers. Uh, referendums is going to ask for $25 million. Uh, because two million will come from existing fund balances. People talk about things like staying within a budget. We saved up two million dollars to go to this, but to save up for a project of this size, inflation basically eats away at your savings. It takes to where getting an idea where you can save up this money and then just write one big check is, is a very difficult and, and really, frankly, something that is not done. If you're like buying a house in cash, not impossible, but most people get some money and pay toward it. That's what we would need to do, even though we have been good stewards and are spending the least we can to save up some money. Tax rate impact will go from 4.19 to approximately 4.37, 0.18. This increase on a $100,000 home will be about $5 per month. If you actually have things like an owner-occupied exemption, because you live in the house that you own for $100,000, it would actually be less than that, a smaller increase. Uh, but this way, it's easier to extrapolate on a $200,000 home or a $300,000 home or a $50,000 home. So uh, those are general costs. Uh, ballot wording. So for those who live in the Skullman School District area, not, not necessarily the city of Skullman, but if your kids go to Skullman uh, by, by nature of where you live, if your tax law has Skullman on it, you're eligible. So $25 million is <coughs> the purpose of basically uh, taking these buildings down, putting a new high school in its place, and going from there. Uh, questions that you guys have for me about anything. We will have building tours available after. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome to leave. Uh, you want to have a guided tour. You're welcome to roam around a little bit on your own. Any questions at all? As far as when we built a new elementary school, I would say the biggest gain that we will get as far as um, <laughs> academics will be partially in things like curriculum alignment and that we can actually move K-5, a lot of curriculum are designed for K-5 with this project. So we had fifth grade used to be in the elementary school. We were in a space, we had people in closets, we think that was a good idea. Fifth grade moved over here. It has been an adjustment. I think we'll see some gains just by getting fifth grade back over there. But I will also say, uh, when you, you guys think about yourselves, if you're in a room that's freezing cold or a room that's really, really hot, it is more difficult to learn. When you have things like move from one class to another because the leak springs up, you know, it's more difficult. And these interrupt learning, as far as actual numbers, our, our scores are generally very positive or, or good. Uh, I don't know what we would see as an improvement, but I think that um, academically re removing some of the disruption will be beneficial. Good question. Others? Will the two new schools go to all be on one level? So it's undecided. We have two designs. We have a one level design, we have a two level design. Uh, right now, uh, and, and the cost is, is comparable, right now I would lean towards it's probably going to be a two, not a three level, but a two level. In some of our community forums that we had, talk about space and issues, they wouldn't have elevator access and, and handicap access and those things. Uh, but even this building at three level, you can't even get into the gymnasium. You know, we had uh, a candidate forum and an individual wheelchair, and you have to get in the elevator and those types of things. Uh, the second floor would be a, a lot of the classroom space. And when you have a student who's in a wheelchair or a student who's on crutches, there are issues, but we do have things like elevator access. It would be much simpler than what we are currently operating with if we do go two stories. There's a one story option, but as we talk about community forums, people talk about other factors such as you know accessibility for parking, whatever else being a factor as well. We don't want students wheelchair or not, crutches or not, to be walking from large distances. We are a little bit landlocked. One advantage is when we talk about operational costs, we gain a lot of efficiencies because we're on one 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 
one site. Uh, we can have our middle school students share an art teacher. We can have middle school students share a kitchen. We're not running three kitchens, we're running two kitchens. So there are a lot of advantages to being here, uh, but in order to go, and we have an option for a, a single story. We also talked about putting a, you know, rebuilding a middle school or something at an alternative site, but those would reduce a lot of our efficiency that let us have a low cost rate of cost of people. Yes? Where are your buses going? What's that? So, so we have a couple different options. One, eventually there is a site plan that if you look just south of the armory, there's a place where we could put the buses. There are also a couple other options we're talking about. We would, and we will rebuild the bus drives with existing fund balances. We will um, potentially lease in the short term while we talk about where they go, lease a bus garage space. Uh, we have several different options we've looked at. Um, but as far as, as a permit truck, we'd like to be as close as we can to the actual school facility. So we have a spot that we have, and we have a couple other options that we're discussing. Other questions? I know that when we did the elementary school, we, there was a lot of talk about consolidation, and that was an attractive feature that students could then come to Sullivan as a consolidation option rather than us going somewhere else. What's the assessment of doing this? So right now, I would say that consolidation does not look like it's extremely, um, is actually like in the near future, but I would say that Sullivan in the area has the largest concentrated population. Uh, we would not be going anywhere. With the elementary addition piece, we are looking to host additional special education programs. I mean, we have to create more space for that and more space in like pre-K programs. There's different funding available for pre-K. If some of that consolidation happened, what we'd actually probably look at is our, our pre-K portions and things like that. We'd actually free up additional classrooms in that manner to take on additional students if we got a large chunk of students that were suddenly coming here. We do have a plan to address that. We also, in some of the spaces, have you know, rooms that uh, are going to function as one thing, like a STEM lab that could actually, we're going to build with a design where it could transform into two classrooms if it needed to in a future date. So we're trying to be looking for the future if we do expand, while at the same time not counting on that. Other questions? change a lot of things as well. When we move fifth grade back over here, move that over here, those students go back over there. We're looking at parking options. Part of the reason that parking is um, more cumbersome, we'll say, is because we really do, we are trying, we, we come out with a safety in mind. We want to make sure we get a kid, in elementary school, a kid gets to a car. A lot of schools, they basically open the doors and you find your places. That would go much quicker, but we'd lose some safety components of that. As far as the high school and middle school, the big portion is make sure we have available parking spots to get to and a, a good drop-off lane. We'll look at that because right now, if there's a middle school, there's no good drop-off portion, and the high school is kind of a free-for-all. There are fewer parents picking up high school students, so they get in their vehicles on themselves. We have looked at that. We don't have an exact plan for that, but it is a factor because in our community meetings, things like parking came up way more times than I thought it would. Other questions? Well, with that said, we'll have people stick around. If you want to take a building tour, you can go find the administrator, find me. We'll go take you and walk around. Uh, if you want to leave, you're, you're absolutely welcome to that as well. I appreciate you coming and listening. If you have additional questions or something comes up as you get away from here, please don't hesitate to let me know. We'd be happy to answer any of those that we can. And we appreciate your time. Thanks so much.